Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to Hira to invite us here to present on the uh, Danish healthcare use cases. Really appreciate the collaboration we're having so far, and, and I hope some of the talks here today will, will create further collaboration between us. I think as we heard earlier today from uh, Nick uh, uh, Klasinga from OECD, uh, these are rather comparable countries uh, when it comes to the use of health data. And I think the tour de force we just had with your modeling during COVID-19 really informs me about how much potential there is in, in our healthcare data. So um, really looking forward to how we can establish that. Talk about establishment, the Data Analytics Center in the Danish Medicines Agency was established formally in 2020, not 21, like written here. That's my mistake. Uh, we had the launch on the 16th of November, and you can see this is the uh, Director General of EMA, uh, Emma Cook, uh, giving a, a kind of gratulatory remark initially. It was actually a first day in office, and I think since then we have really enjoyed, enjoyed the work with EMA and the regulatory network in Europe on big data analytics. Now the purpose with the establishment of the Data Analytics Center really goes hand in hand with the vision and the mission for the Medicines Agency, which is to make sure that we have safe and effective medicines for our citizens, society and animals, uh, but also making sure that the medical devices are safe for use. And for that purpose, we want to use the clinical and the real world data with advanced analytics to get a better understanding and, uh, and handle on any situation. This is not ourselves talking about this. This is actually now strategies across Europe. So if we look into the EMA regulatory science strategy towards 2025, if we look into the network of the competent authorities in the member states, like the medicines agency is also in that strategy. And then more formally and more concretely, we defined it in the big data task force with the initiatives to, to take on, on the topic across Europe until 2025. Now, the situation we have in, in Europe and many places in the world is that we are seeing an increase in data availability. Uh, you can call these e-sources. They are basically born electronically from, from the set point. We just saw the analysis on the claims data, what we are having access to in Denmark would primarily be registries, so that's our focus area of the data we use. The registries in Denmark, I think there are more than 350 of them in total that cover everything from healthcare to socioeconomic to, to environmental factors as well. Uh, the majority of them that we are interested in are the 40 plus you see here with the Danish Health Data Authority that we can actually then link together with the other registries to create new insights uh, in our society and our citizens' uh, health. And when we talk about health for our citizens, the registries actually allow us to get this from birth, from cradle to grave, with everything in between, from any encounter with the healthcare system, from any prescriptions, any vaccinations, and so forth. All of that, again, linking uh, the data together with our civil registration number uh, that allows this to happen. The data is captured at the GP level, at the hospital, at the pharmacy, and also in the municipality where caregiving is actually being provided. And all of that then sits in this data cube with the Danish Health Data Authority, allowing the use of that data to be done by health authorities, the healthcare system, research, and the public. To some of the points we saw earlier from OECD and, and also WHO, getting to the learning healthcare system. Now the access to this, just to make that very clear, because there's a trust relationship between the authorities and, and the citizens, really is highly controlled. So access can be given to researchers that on this closed environment and secure environment can actually work with the data. The data cannot leave the system. That has a rather strict rules and, and, and borders around it, so data is being kept absolutely secure. Um, and there's also the GDPR, which is our general data protection regulation in Europe that requires us to all, always scrutinize uh, the concepts of data minimization, anonymization, wherever possible. When we go back to the Data Analytics Center, uh, we created a governance structure around our projects that really reaches out to the academic institutions. 
I think it's fairly well known from a lot of publications that these institutions are really some of the leading uh, globally when it talks, we talks about epidemiology and pharmacoepidemiology. So we created a steering group with the four major universities, uh, each of their faculty of health in uh, Aalborg, Aarhus, Southern Denmark and Copenhagen, but also combined in the Danish Technical University and the IT University to really get a, a cross skill approach to analytics that I think we're starting to see the fruition of. Those make up our scientific collaboration uh, forum where we then carry out uh, some of our projects. One of the projects we had was actually launched before our official launch. That was when COVID-19 hit Denmark with the first patient. Uh, that was actually on the 27th of February in 2020. We back then uh, formed a steering group uh, being composed of many of the actors in the Danish healthcare system, the medicines agency, the patient organization called Danish Patients, the health data agency, the faculty of health sciences, the Danish regions, and the region's own quality program with their registries and the Staten Serum Institute that is the authority for infectious diseases in Denmark. The steering group would have to evaluate proposals, much like we heard with the data set that was released here in Korea, but we would have an expert group that based on these proposals would actually evaluate them, the steering group would approve them, and then they would go on to being analyzed by the likes of Anton Podegor and, and, and others to actually then really facilitate uh, high, uh, high, highly executed uh, quality-wise and speed in terms of analysis. Uh, between the Aarhus University and University of Southern Denmark in particular, but also the Staten Serum Institute and the Danish Medicines Agency. A few of the examples of what we did, um, one of them I think was the first we had to do to inform us about a situation in the Medicines Agency, was back to the WHO recommending not to use NS8, the likes of ibuprofen, uh, due to the risk of that uh, giving a severe disease progression for COVID-19 severe ill patients. In order to better understand this, uh, we, we took some of the first data we had on uh, COVID-19 positive patients, uh, which is the MEBA database, combined that with the National Patient Registry and the National Prescription Registry. 85% of ibuprofen in Denmark is not over the counter, it's actually per prescription. So those really in need of it, we knew who had taken that and when they've taken it. At the end of the analysis, we had a total of 400 and 249 cases we could actually investigate for more than 700 person years of follow-up to understand um, that this was actually not something to be concerned about, thus leading to a change in, in the recommendation around uh, the use of ibuprofen. And more importantly, we were looking into challenges about supply of medicines in general with a global pandemic Thus, knowing that we should not have to substitute ibuprofen was actually uh, somewhat of a relief back then. Following this, we continue to have an interest in the effect of COVID-19 on medicines. Um, the, the next analysis, and probably one of the last ones uh, we have done so far, was the post-acute effect of COVID-19 in non-hospitalized individuals. The purpose of that was really to understand that with long COVID, uh, what were the complications, what were the treatment and, and uh, hospitalization needs and, and healthcare needs of these, uh, these citizens. So we also here did a population-based cohort study using the Danish prescription, patient and health insurance registries as they are available. We, um, from the very early days on, we're able to identify 8,900 people with COVID-19. This is between the 27th of February to the end of May. So a very short period in the beginning, but we then follow these for six months to understand what kind of uh, healthcare needs would they be seeking. The important part here is really we, then, we, we needed that information to do an estimate of what could be the effect on, 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 uh, on, on healthcare. Uh, in, in, in this respect, and especially around medication. So we looked for that for, seven, for 14 different drugs and also looked at 27 hospital diagnoses. We matched these close to 9,000 COVID-19 uh, uh, positive patients with around 80,000 uh, test negative individuals. 
What we found on this one is really difficult to read from a distance, but hopefully in the handout notes, you can actually see the two groups were rather similar when we compared them, how they were matched. You can also somewhat take away from the visualization here that the need of hospitalization or meeting the GP were quite similar as well. Not a major difference, which is somewhat reassuring. Doesn't mean that long COVID isn't a thing, it really is, but it, it did not have that massive impact on our healthcare system at the time. We also looked at the initiation of new drugs. We didn't really see much of a change back then. Maybe it's justified to do another analysis, but we only saw uh, something around short-acting uh, beta-2 agonists and tryptans, which is not really surprising uh, given uh, the COVID-19 disease itself. We saw a few uh, um, additional increases in dyspnea and venous thromboembolism, which obviously then became of an interesting uh, situation a little bit later. Because when we start rolling out the vaccine, I think this is uh, known to most by now, that in Denmark we actually did a pulsation of the AstraZeneca vaccine in March uh, 2021. Due to very few cases initially that came about with really severe events uh, around people that had been vaccinated. Um, in totality across Europe, we actually saw 30 cases of these uh, venous thromboembolisms. It then led to an analysis we had to do in Denmark between the Danish registries and the Norwegian registries to fully understand this. And within a month, it was actually possible for the researchers to pull the data together between the two countries, get to the understanding about whether this potential signal was a real or not. And our adjustment was, this is actually real. It doesn't mean that it's unsafe to use the AstraZeneca vaccine. It just meant in the situation of the Danish pandemic, it was unfavorable in a risk-benefit comparison to administer the vaccine versus giving them a different option of effectively not. It was actually matched against uh, not receiving a vaccine. Uh, the virus itself causes the same thing, right? So just rarely. Now, then you have a, a group of uh, people which is rather large in the Danish context of 150, 140 uh, thousand people who had only received a single shot AstraZeneca. What to do? Well, we had to provide them a booster, an additional vaccine that moved us into a new situation where we now looked into an off-label use of a messenger RNA vaccine because we now offered them to, to get that as a second dose. What we did for that purpose was a collaboration with the Staten Serum Institute to do a real-time surveillance in the time span when this was administered. We then did an analysis in which we had a comparative cohort of people receiving a first and second vaccination of the Pfizer vaccine to compare uh, against. And that's allowing us real-time or close to real-time to react in case we would have seen any increase in, um, in, in uh, adverse events. Again, for the purpose here, the central person registry, the microbiology database, and now here also the vaccination registry, something that, that we would have absolutely real-time updated uh, if you were administered a vaccine within 15 minutes that would actually be recorded in the database and available on your phone in an app that we had created for the purpose. And then the national prescription registry to really understand any uh, adverse reactions that may occur in these registries. The conclusions came out recently. We updated the data a bit with also a, a potential fourth uh, dose. And uh, the results are really reassuring that we did not see uh, any increase of serious adverse events compared to the homologous messenger RNA vaccine schedules, which is also what we saw back in the time, but continue to see. Well, this really moves us into thinking about what could you potentially do in the future when we talk about the use of the registries and real-world data in general uh, for safety surveillance. A bit of history around the safety surveillance setup that we have globally, the establishment of FDA back in 1937 uh, with uh, the sulfonyl limit uh, case back then. Uh, Talidomid case, which led to the spontaneous reporting system in 1958. And then more recently, we had a few cases where uh, Toratrast, that was really detrimental uh, for the patients, and Vioxx, where 
maybe we were not acting as fast as we possibly could. Uh, so it's, it's not the best stories of, of how to act uh, to adverse drug reactions. Obviously, it then led us to a reflection going back to the HPC vaccine in Denmark, where some media attention had created the notion that there were adverse drug reactions to that vaccine. I think it took a number of years before the analysis was there to kind of demystify that that was not the case. At least we cannot see it in our data. I think we've had similar situations before with vaccines and, and uh, kind of uh, media attention or other rumors creating uh, uh, adverse drug reactions that didn't exist. So we are quite concerned about COVID-19 and the uh, communication effort around that. But I think we've actually managed fairly well to neutrally and, uh, and uh, rather objectively uh, tell what's up and down with these vaccines. In reality, we're looking at an estimate of 40,000 serious adverse drug reactions every year in Denmark in the population and potentially estimated 2,000 deaths. Not all of this is actually being reported in the system. That's where some other sources will really play a very, very important value going forward. The pharmacovigilance system today, for those of you unfamiliar with it in Europe, uh, is that there are several reporting access that can report an adverse drug reaction. There are channels that will take these through, whether that's safety studies, whether that's reporting mechanisms online or with your physician. And then we as a medicine agency receive those, handle these, review these, qualify them, send them on to the European Medicines Agency, on to WHO, and that may actually raise a safety signal that then could become a verified signal and then lead to an implementation of a regulatory action. Now, what if we were thinking about pharmacovigilance of tomorrow, really fueling that with the data from the registries, from the hospital EHR, and also from the private medical practitioners as well? And what if we applied artificial intelligence and automation to some of that data flow and then do a real-time surveillance on that data so then through that uh, develop signaling and hypothesis generation? If we look at the current model, how that will look, that could effectively accelerate the process. And I think time and speed is of the essence when we're talking about rollouts like the COVID-19 vaccine Potentially, we'll have another pandemic in the future. Potentially, we'll have something else we need to roll out in a similar fashion. So speed is of the essence. We're actually building that right now. We are standing on a foundation where we do the existing signaling management as we, we do. Uh, we just saw that briefly of the reporting mechanisms and identification of signals. We've actually established a few cases where the registries have now been put into place to help us to understand uh, what is potentially a signal, what to react to, and create the evidence. Um, and then what we are now building together with University of Copenhagen, Southern Denmark, Staten Serum Institute, epidemiologists, computer scientists, and Danish patients is, uh, is being launched the day after tomorrow, uh, officially, as we have received the funding to start to combine all of these data sources in a research project over the next three years to make an AI-based uh, side effect signaling setup. It's ambitious, we hope we'll succeed, but I'm absolutely certain we'll learn a lot while we try to do so that will hopefully accelerate us further in a modernization of our regulatory approach while remaining consistent uh, in, in the way we work. Now the potential in building this data is you can argue somewhat limited in Denmark. If you're only 5.8 million people, that's where if we look beyond our borders, we're looking for collaboration, we're looking for more power, we're looking for like-minded, like here in Korea, to uh, expand on, on how to increase the data pool. We actually uh, did an analysis for the EMA um, earlier this year, um, looking at the comparative effectiveness of heterolog and homologous primary and, and booster uh, vaccine schedules in the Nordic countries. These countries are rather similar between Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. We have this individual level information in all of the four countries and the same endpoints. The um, citizens are actually all being assigned, not only citizens, the residents who live there, are being assigned a unique person identified birth or immigration. 
So unambiguously, we can actually link the registries together. In a supplementary material, you have all of the 40 plus registries in use for this. The registries are slightly differently updated, but uh, it, it's between daily to weekly that uh, they update it. So some of the analysis we can do, we can do it uh, fairly up until the time of the analysis itself. If you uh, were at the International Conference for Pharmacopoeiology last week in Copenhagen, you may have seen this. This is EMA on a poster presenting a number of initiatives using real-world evidence. So this is really making a move into the regulatory decision process. And part of this poster is also the preliminary, preliminary results. This is not fully published yet, uh, but you'll see some of the curves of where a heterolog vaccine um, performs better than a homolog vaccine. And in some cases, it actually does not. So there's still some biology to learn here as to why there are differences. But it's really, really important that these uh, data sources and approaches start to become a very important instrument in the regulatory decision making. What I'm really proud about with the effort here of the four countries coming together is that we had the study plan ready on the 10th of March. We had the study protocol done three weeks later and by the end of June, the study report was done. And also know the publication manuscript is actually ready for submission. And if not mistaken, then I think on EU pass, you should actually be able to find the entire study report. Uh, it was actually an intention that should be make, made public last week. Um, and just as a final note as well, we were talking about the, uh, the, 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 the children early in the earlier presentation. So we are rerunning this on, on children as well in terms of safety and efficacy. That's the footnote here. So uh, that will come out sometime early next year. Um, and also looking at the fourth dose now. That's actually also official. When we talk about the governance structure beyond the academic collaboration, we're also reaching out to other uh, medicines agencies and the European Medicines Agency. Uh, call that the cluster of excellence or in general also what is uh, known to us as the big data work, which is really trying to plan out uh, the work around data analytics in Europe. Ambitious work plan uh, that has a primary objective of creating a network like we just saw with the Nordic countries, but in a federated fashion. So imagine that you have data sources in Germany, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland that you can connect through this network, distribute the analysis, and pull the results back and aggregate them. So we leave data where it should belong in the individual countries, but we actually collaborate in the safest possible way uh, to, to perform and generate the evidence we need. An ambition task a very ambitious task that will go on for the next five years, but I think we'll see some of the first analysis towards the end of the year, early next year. At least we've shown in Nordic countries we can easily do it. Real-world evidence becomes the thing across the ambition for the European Medicines Agency over the next many years. In the pre-authorization phase, in the evaluation phase of new medicines, and once they get approved, also in post-authorization, what we're quite used to using real-world evidence already is part of the way of, of understanding a potential signal by doing a, a safety analysis in existing data. But all of the committees abbreviated here, pediatric, orphan drugs, uh, human medicines, real-world data, there's a plan to make sure that actually plays a role in different forms, different use cases, but also an ambition for the next three, four years. The work plan is ambitious. Um, if you see the three top ones to the left in kind of the uh, purple to, to deep blue, that is more the technical, data quality, data framework, and uh, also metadata catalog. If you look at the blue green, greenish, those are the ones that have to do with human capacity. So our ability, the competences in the network to actually make use of this data goes also into the green. From the yellow and onwards is governance and ethics. Again, making sure we have an ethical approach the way we use data. And then in the, uh, in the orange and red, international collaboration. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. And then also veterinary medicines, because we also deal with the veterinary medicine situation in the agencies. If we look across the agencies in Europe, we're also now creating what we call clusters of excellence for collaboration. 
In these clusters, we're bringing the agencies together that have a strategic prioritized interest in some of these areas. 27 member states in Europe are not all alike, but those who are investing in these areas have this forum to really collaborate. So there's a cluster around artificial intelligence between the German, Danish, and the Swedish agencies. There's one on high performance computing, again, making most use of the infrastructure we have between Spain, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. And then clusters on real world data that also then beyond the other countries now include uh, Por the Portuguese agency and the Dutch agency too. And then patient level data analysis, something you do at the FDA and PMDA for approval, but not in Europe yet. Also an interest between the Danish and the Dutch agency. So again, coming together here to build the capabilities and the capacity to handle data analytics in the way we operate. As we discussed this, we realized this, we can define with a Danish approach of building blocks. So there are components here. We need to think about data access, legal aspects, capabilities that we just discussed, the infrastructure, the method development, sharing new methods we're not used to using, and also coming together to make the ethical appropriate use of artificial intelligence wherever possible. This is not only a European approach, and I'm really happy to be here with Hira today to talk about this, because in many ways we strive for global approach around these things. And I'm really happy that the recent real world evidence meeting we had in the ICPA consortium for international uh, collaboration for medical uh, regulatory agencies led to this statement where the focus is to foster global efforts and further enable the integration of real world evidence into regulatory decision making. So really trying to harmonize the global approach around this. So in summary, we just showed in the presentation here uh, how a wide range of registries uh, that to us are linkable have been instrumental in our ability to analyze real world data COVID-19. Uh, collaboration around the Danish healthcare system has been the key enabler in doing this. So really bringing all of us together Real-time data has allowed us to move to near real-time surveillance of off-label use, thus building a new capability in safety. Incrementally improving, reusing existing uh, data structures and processes has also led to an efficient Nordic collaboration on topics too small for Denmark alone to answer. And I think that goes beyond uh, even the Nordic region. And the use of real-world data and real-world evidence in Europe and globally is increasing. And also here, collaboration is something we support and take active roles in. Thank you for listening.